When films explore fascism, it's often by retelling its most shocking events. The focus tends to be placed on the battlegrounds or the carnage in concentration camps. Focusing on the most dramatic and horrifying elements is one way of dismantling this ideology. But what a special day does is far more scathing. Instead, this film follows two neighbors who live mostly innocuous lives, both miserable, both alone, and both the quiet victims of fascism. Our characters may not be in concentration camps, but they too are shattered under Mussolini's boot. We're introduced to Antonietta for a four minute tracking shot. It's the early hours of the morning and she's been awake for a while. The camera follows her around every crevice of her husband's cramped apartment. One child after another is introduced to the point where it's almost comical. Her husband even relies on her to wake him up. Filming it all in one shot keeps the pace slower to emphasize just how tedious and complicated the process of preparing her family is. This technique stresses just how tiring Antonietta's role is. Something initially comical becomes tragic when you consider that she most likely does this every single day. She's the glue that holds the family together, and for this, she's given nothing. She's the quintessence of the ideal woman in fascist society, maternal, industrious, and entirely self-sacrificing, a slave to her husband, and by extension, the state. Our introduction to Gabriel is in binary opposition. He symbolizes the antithesis of the ideal man in Mussolini's Italy, emotional, single, and afraid. In one shot, he intently stares at a loaded gun, and it's clear, he's miserable. The desperation the characters share is caused by the rigid expectations under fascism, and their actions throughout the film are born out of this anguish. We see this desperation shape Antonietta especially. She's deeply ashamed of herself and her position in society. Her neighbors delight in mocking her for having to stay at home because her husband can't afford a maid. In a futile attempt to attract Gabriel, most likely the first man she's interacted with in a while, she folds her worn-out socks to conceal stains, changes her battered shoes, adjusts her messy hair, and contemplates applying makeup. In the opening, she scolds her daughter repeatedly for acting similarly. Antonietta desires her daughter's freedom and beauty, both of which are ripped away from her by culturally enforced marital serfdom. Due to her being forced into domesticated housework and becoming disenfranchised, Antonietta's husband, Emmanuel, a much older, out of shape, unattractive man, feels entitled not only to her body, but no. also those of other women. References to Antonietta's lack of education are rife within the film. To her husband, Antonietta is a maid and a means to have babies. The dynamic between the two is one of the crucial critiques Scholar levies upon fascism and how it destroys relationships between men and women. Under the guise of tradition, it creates a world where women are forced to sacrifice autonomy and in turn, get no respect from their husbands. Gabriel himself is desperate to be accepted in so far that he assumes the role of a jester, dancing, goofing and playing around all in a desperate attempt to obfuscate the underlying suicidal thoughts. Before this, he's seen pleading on the phone to a lover already in prison. He begs him to laugh, to no avail. The scene where Gabriel and Antonietta have sex is the film's heaviest critique of fascist societal norms. Gabriel, a gay man, desperate to be embraced and feel loved, and unable to do so because of the zeitgeist, closes his eyes and accepts her advances. Antonietta, a married woman, alienated from her husband, throws herself at the first man she sees. Pain, projection, and desperation are all perfectly portrayed in this one scene. Sophia Loren, the siren of Italian cinema, and Marcello Mastorani, the suave, charismatic ladies' man, are both transformed. They look disheveled, exhausted, beaten down, and stripped of any glamour. Seeing such alluring actors appear like this was surely a shock to Italian audiences, 
and a form of communicating just how crushing that period was for the average Italian. The entire film is underpinned by the sound of Hitler and Mussolini's rally. Whether indoors, outdoors, or on the roof, fascist rhetoric bounces off of every surface. Privacy seems to be non-existent. The tower block reflects this. Each apartment has huge open windows, and the building has a U-shaped structure. The apartment complex resembles a panopticon more than anything else, giving residents the impression of being watched at all times. The very architectural style of the building, a reference to the omnipresent spectre of the state. And finally, there is time itself. The sound of abnormally loud ticking clocks pervades many crucial scenes. Antonietta sets alarms throughout the film to remind her of the passing of the day. The film itself is done mostly in real time, making the viewer feel the effect of every minute past. In turn, the film feels like a ticking time bomb. We have the benefit of hindsight, unlike the characters in the diegesis. We know of the carnage over the horizon. The layering of the fascist rally over the constant ticking creates a sense of impending doom. An atrocity is on its way, and no one knows it yet. The ending is just as hopeless. Gabriel is captured and escorted off by secret police, and Antonietta steps into the shadows to lay beside her abusive husband. Make no mistake, there is no happy ending, no chance for optimism, and worse yet, this is just the beginning. <laughs>